Welcome to Building Better Businesses. I'm Kristen Dees, founder of Catalyst Consulting, an agency that helps small businesses and entrepreneurs start, grow, and level up their businesses. This podcast will bring you interviews with experts in all things business related. Have questions for a business attorney? We've got answers. How about your health insurance? Got you covered there too. New episodes coming your way every week. Find us on the podcasting platform of your choice. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Building Better Businesses with Catalyst Consulting. Uh, My guest today is Tracy Bissett, um, and she is a financial wizard and is here to share some of her knowledge and expertise with us. Thanks for joining us, Tracy. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So tell us a little bit about you as a human being. Uh, So I am based in Canada. So I grew up in uh, on the East Coast in Nova Scotia, and I make my home now in Toronto, Ontario. Um, loved money ever since I was a little kid, uh, learned from the age of seven that you could use it as a tool to help you get stuff and do stuff that you wanted. Um, so was really entrepreneurial through my teen years and then went on to business school and actually became a banker. Uh, so spent many, many years in banking, helping entrepreneurs get access to financing. And then uh, several years ago, I started my own business where I pooled together all the things I love to do, um, primarily helping people learn about money. So I I work with entrepreneurs across all different industries, uh, as well as young adults to help them learn about money. And it's really around coaching and education um, so that people can hit their goals and achieve their dreams. So uh, really fun to do that for me. Nice. Yeah, I feel like it's um, a lot of people are pretty intimidated by money in general, like they're just hasn't always been um, a level of accessibility to it, I think. So depending on how you were raised and maybe if your parents were in banking or something, you might have some extra knowledge, but it seems like it's one of those things that really gets in the way for people and creates a lot of like mindset blocks too. So I think it's really cool what you do. The education is important um, because otherwise we'll never know. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so share a fun fact about you. I absolutely love concerts and I love roller coasters. Oh, interesting. What kind of concerts do you, or just like anything or? Pretty much. I love pop, rock, country. Um, So last year was really hard for me during COVID because I had Mm -hmm. about 25 concerts I had tickets for. So um, (gasps) we're probably not in Canada going to go to any this year in 2021, but I've already got some uh, lined up for 2022. So I'm excited. Nice. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, How many have you gone to? Do you know? No, um, probably thousand over my lifetime or more. Yeah, That's it's crazy. one yeah. thing uh, a lot of people would say, um, and they would judge me about how I spend my money. But I believe everyone can spend their money on whatever they want, as long as they're living within their means. So that's one thing I get a lot of enjoyment out of. So I'm happy mm-hmm. to spend my money on concerts. Yeah, no, I th- I've talked to a few uh, people like, you know, bookkeepers, accounts, that kind of they're like, you can have a budget for whatever you want. I was like, all I care about is tattoos and travel. Um, <laughs> I mean, like eating is important. But like, as far as the fun stuff goes, like, <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, I should be able to do the things that I want to do, too. So I like that. And roller coasters. Oh, you're a brave soul. Do you like the crazy <laughs> ones, like the scary ones? I love the the really high ones. Um, the, the more modern ones are really good because the tracks are really slick and there, there's no jerkiness when they where you feel the track connect. So uh-huh. um, the longer, the better. And, and when they go upside down is awesome and I love the heights and the speed. So that's funny. Yeah. So a little, <laughs> a little bit of an adrenaline junkie then. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, very cool. Uh, those are good fun facts. I like it. Uh, so um, how do you kind of provide support for entre- entrepreneurs and business owners? Like if you're, do you do like a lot of one-on-one coaching or how does that work? Uh, so I offer two, two regular services. So whether it be in a group program, so where um, multiple entrepreneurs are working together to get the financial education. Um, our program we have right now is the cash control boot camp over a six week um, period. And so multiple entrepreneurs are coming together as well as I do a lot of one on one work. Um, where it's over three to six months um, with a particular entrepreneur or entrepreneur. Sometimes it's um, business partners. Sometimes it's a couple. uh, They're working together on their business finances. And so that gets a little bit more in depth. We're working directly on their numbers. Um, So those those two kinds of options as well. um, I do consulting for um, for businesses on different things that they might need. So that's a little bit more customized. Um, But primarily it's the the group or the one on one coaching. Okay, very cool. Um, what, uh, oh, sorry. 
<laughs> this gets edited at some point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about your background and how you ended up. You kind of talked about like being in banking and stuff, but how did you end up to your own your own business, your own coaching business? Uh, so I was working at TD Bank, which is Canada's one of Canada's big five banks, also kind of on the eastern seaboard in the U.S. Um, there, 16 years, all, always moving ahead, different uh, levels of promotion. And so I directly supported entrepreneurs and business owners to get access to financing. And for many years, I actually approved uh, loans for them. So for about eight years. And then there came a day, as there usually is in big companies, there was restructuring. And so my seat was taken away. And, and so instead of going back to a role in another bank, I decided to package up all of the things that I like to do. Um, so teaching people about the things that I have experience with, sharing my experience. And I knew that for uh, the entrepreneurs that I work with, they're typically uh, sales up to about $2 million. Um, that's, that's my sweet spot up to that across all industries. I know that money and knowledge about financial side of their business can be a really big barrier to, to making their dreams a success. So I really targeted in on that area and um, started a podcast and really everything I do is about um, helping take that mystery out of money and helping take the fear out of it. So it can be really unemotional. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Cause it really is uh, emotional is a good word for it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, cause it eventually relates to your personal finances too. Mm -hmm. So I know it's like when you first start out, it's like, Oh my God, am I going to be able to pay my bills? Um, <laughs> we'll see. Um, I mean, not for everyone, if people do it the right way, probably and just um, save up and, take out loans or whatever it might be. But, um, okay. So what are some of the biggest mistakes you see entrepreneurs making when it comes to their finances? Uh, so the first one is not taking accountability for the financial side of the business. And so even if you're a CEO of uh, one of yourself and the company, or you're leading a team and you have a bigger organization or you're working with contractors, there's no way you can hit your goals and actually drive the, the direction of the business without knowing your numbers. And so people generally fall into one or two camps. One is if I work really hard, I'll make sales and everything's going to work out. So I don't need to look at the numbers or I've hired a bookkeeper and an accountant and they're handling it. Um, so I don't need to look at the numbers as well. And neither of those is really a good situation. We don't want anybody kind of burying their head in the sand or deferring to someone else. You can absolutely have someone do your bookkeeping and have an accountant do your financial statements. But as the owner, it's really your responsibility to be accountable for those numbers make sure you like the way they're trending, use them to drive the strategy in your business, solve problems, think, think about what's happening, what might happen in the future. Um, so that's a, a really big one. Another one is um, not getting a steady paycheck. And that usually comes for from a few different reasons. And uh, one being pricing is a little bit out of whack. And I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But um, I would say 85% of the clients that I work with, their pricing is not right. And as a result, they've got cash flow challenges. They're not able to make payroll when they need to. They're not getting themselves a paycheck, which is part of the reason they started a business. Um, so that, that can be a problem. And the, the third one that, that's pretty prevalent is not understanding the difference between your sales and your expenses and that profit and the cash flow cycle of your business. And so you can be really profitable on paper. Uh, but if you have clients who pay you later after you do your work or you deliver your product to them, um, you can actually go out of business in that time if they're not paying you for, for kind of a delayed period. So understanding you can be profitable on paper from your sales and your expenses. But if you're not getting the cash coming in that corresponds with that, um, your business can be in trouble. And, and too often that cash flow is generally the problem. And it doesn't mean that um, there's a problem in the business that you're not doing well and you're not selling well. When you when you grow really quickly, cash flow becomes a challenge too. So it uh, can happen all kinds of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that makes sense too. So when it comes to like the cash flow and like payment cycles and stuff like that, how are there businesses where people just have to wait until the end? Because like I'm always of the mindset just because maybe I'm service-based that, um, I take some money up front, period. Like that's a hundred percent. Um, and then I, there's different payment structures depending on what the, the client's doing, but, um, to allow for some of that, like, you know, the, the money's still coming in while the work is being done. It's not just like waiting till the end. Is there something where like, it kind of has to wait like other industries? Um, so it is different by industry, but even within a, a service-based industry, people can do whatever they want. And so people don't necessarily think about it. Um, if you were going to go and you're going to plan an event, an event planner is not going to even book a, a, 
a gig with you unless they get 50% up front and they get the rest before the event actually takes place. Sometimes coaches or consultants, they might send invoices out after their, their service is provided and then wait for payment to come in. Um, mm -hmm. Doing graphic design work again, you're probably going to take a, um, a deposit up front. You might have some milestone payments. If you're doing a website, things like that. If you're dealing with big corporates and they're your clients, usually you have to send them an invoice and then it goes through their whole payroll pro or their um, supplier payment um, process, which can take weeks. So you might get paid in 30, 60, 90 days later. Um, and so understanding one, what's normal for my industry to actually thinking about it before you start invoicing clients so that you can be clear with them up front. And if you want to take money up front, then explain to them that's how it's going to be. And if they want to be your client, that's how they're going to do it. Um, and knowing how that cash flow actually is going to move through your business. So for anybody who's listening, who's not really sure, think through the journey of one customer dealing with you and where does the money flow and when. That's a really good way to kind of get a handle on it. And if you're not liking the way that flow is, um, you probably can't do much in terms of changing things with existing clients, but you certainly can make changes for new clients that you're going to bring on board. And so any things that you're not happy with, you can certainly correct it to, to change that flow of the cash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Because um, at the beginning of, you know, actual lockdown and everything like that, I had to start d doing a lot more stuff online. And so I um, started offering like social media content management and some strategy stuff. And I was using Fiverr, the freelance platform. Mm -hmm. Um, cause this was also like only six months after I started my business too, by the way. <laughs> so it was like, I was like, oh crap. Okay. I'm going to have to, you know, pivot as they say. So, um, that payment structure was tough because like I wouldn't get paid out for two weeks after the project was completed. Mm -hmm. So if I was doing like a month long, um, content management service then I wouldn't get paid out until after, but then I had other like actual one-on-one -on -one clients where I did, I had it kind of mixed up. So um, some people would pay every other week. Some people would pay weekly. Some people would pay like a month at a time. It just kind of depended. So it gave me a little bit of flexibility when it comes to, like you said, the cash flow. And then once it caught up to where I was consistently getting paid out for the clients that I had started, the content management stuff, it kind of, but yeah, it was a little, <laughs> it was a little touch and go for a minute. I was like, oh man, I'm going to have to do something different for a little bit here. But yeah, most people don't think um, yeah. of it. And, and it's so true. Like you can have the sales and know that it, you're going to have enough money at some point. But if you don't yeah. have the cash on the days you need it, um, then you either have to have access to credit. So whether mm -hmm. it's overdraft credit card line of credit, or personal funds that you can put in to, to kind of bridge those those gaps. Because um, you're ultimately you're going to have enough, but can you make it through until that day comes is really the challenge. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you're trying to get any kind of help or if you're having to pay for stuff too, because mm -hmm. that was always, I'm like, I have to, I pay, I have, I don't even know, hundreds of dollars of subscriptions to various programs, you know, that I yeah. do for the different things. So um, yeah, it's like, man, you gotta, gotta give yourself a little bit of that, the cash flow cushion. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And then I had another question too on that, like taking accountability for your finances, because I know that that's an area that a lot of people struggle with too. And like I just happen to have the experience and you happen to have the experience and the, the expertise where you know how this stuff works. Um, like I've, I have a strong background in operations management. So I've been involved in P&Ls and budget planning and revenue strategy and all that stuff like since, <laughs> since the beginning. But um, what do you kind of recommend for people as far as like taking those steps? Like it's great that they have a bookkeeper and accountant or at least if they're, they have QuickBooks or something, like they're doing something, but they're not actually looking at the stuff, like how, how do you suggest they do that? So first thing is to recognize for everybody listening who might be in that situation, it's not your fault. So the school system does yep. a really poor job of teaching you anything, even personal finance related. And then most people started their businesses because they excel at whatever they do. They didn't go into a program where they learned about how to run a business from a financial side. So I usually find people are, are embarrassed about the lack of financial knowledge. Whereas if it was about websites or social media or sales, there doesn't seem to be the same stigma. So just firstly getting over that and accepting that it's something you need to learn to run your business and to, to grow it. So um, from there, um, you can take courses, you can listen to podcasts, you can read books. Uh, I think people will know the way that they learn best. Uh, and if you're, if you learn best by having someone walk you through things and explain it, you can take courses certainly at um, various colleges or online. Um, but if working with a coach is the right thing to do, 
ask for recommendations. Ask people you know how they learned. Um, don't presume it's your accountant who's going to teach you because it's actually not their job. A lot of people think that the accountant's supposed to teach them that stuff. The accountant's there to do your tax returns and your financial statements. You may be able to pay them more and they can teach you, but they often are not always the best teachers either because that's not their forte and that's not what they love to do. So get some recommendations, referrals, make sure it's someone that you relate to and they talk to you in a way that makes sense to you, that you don't feel embarrassed, you don't feel ashamed to ask more questions and you actually get inspired to, to ask more questions. I usually start all of the work um, that I do with the private coaching with an assessment of the, the company. And so it gives us a place to start where I'm coming from the number standpoint, but the person knows what's been happening in their business, how it felt, what decisions they were making when these results were happening. So it gives a good chance for then the questions to start formulating. Because I know when you don't know, it's hard to ask any question. You're not really sure what to say and even to, to get that ball rolling. So mm -hmm. the most important is is ask somebody you know um, for a recommendation and then make sure that you, you get along well with them. Uh, it's, le it's important that they have credentials and they're knowledgeable, um, but more importantly that, that they can talk and you guys can communicate in a way that uh, is comfortable to you and you feel like you can get the answers that you need. Mm -hmm. I guess so important too, like when you're any kind of like coaching type of relationship is talk to a ton of people. Like it took me forever to find a financial planner that I really liked because I felt like, you know, half of them were just trying to sell me life insurance. <laughs> and then the other half were just like at a whole different level. I'm like, nah, like this is what I'm, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. So it took me a while. I mean, I talked to at least a dozen probably over the course of like six months or a year. So um, don't settle. It's just like a relationship. Like don't mm -hmm. settle, you know, like hold out for the right one. <laughs> Yeah, and you can um, start with start with the right people to ask. So yeah. you could ask your banker, your lawyer, other business owners that you know. And especially if you have a really special, you're in a specialized industry, there might be someone who who's more knowledgeable about that industry too, who can help you. Mm -hmm. um, so that you get to the right person. And it is about the fit. It needs to be someone who's not going to talk down to you, who's not going to use acronyms and make it super complicated. It's about you getting comfortable. It's not about them showing off what they know. Yeah. No, that's good. I like that. Um, so how do you understand your financial position, like assess costing and profits, and then start making some real money from your business? Uh, so uh, I always encourage um, my clients to do a couple things. Um, one, get your books up to date so that you know on a monthly basis, how, what were your sales, what were your expenses, and if you made a profit. I encourage them all to have a cash flow forecast and uh, we can do it in Excel. It doesn't need to be fancy, but we're going to um, forecast all of the money coming in and all of the money going out so we can see if we might have a problem. And I highly encourage them to do it for a six month period. So obviously, the farther we get away from today, the more fuzzy it is, but we're going to take a shot at it. Uh, so that it allows us to plan. And if we see that we might have some shortfalls, maybe we're going to um, call our customers who haven't paid us and collect faster. Maybe we are going to put a push on sales. Maybe we want to hire someone and we want to see when we can afford to do that. So it gives us that ability to do all of that planning. And then um, what if you're just starting your business, I encourage you to do it then, but it's always a good time to check your pricing. So we want to make sure that you're actually making money on what you sell, whether it be a product or a service. And um, as I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, about 85% of the clients that I'm working with, they're not pricing at a profitable level. Um, so there's no uh, confusion then when they, we do that math to see why you can't get a steady paycheck because you're not making enough money. Mm -hmm. For service-based, especially the biggest um, culprit is not charging for your time. Um, because if you're doing most of the delivery yourself, you think, well, I've got all these hours. I can just work whenever. It'll be okay. Um, I highly encourage uh, my clients to include at least the amount they would have to pay someone else to do it. So maybe you have more expertise th uh, than someone who can do it. Um, so you maybe you're not going to get your rate, but at least you're charging out so that you know if when you grow your business, you can afford to replace you with someone else. And that person's not going to be flexible about getting paid as flexible as you're going to be in your own business. Yeah. So. It's very, very true. Yeah, it's, it's a whole different game. Uh, you have to be able to pay the people. So, okay. So when it comes to the pricing strategy, what are some things that people need to know? Like how do they, you know, how do they calculate? Where do they start? So I, I encourage two different ways. Um, firstly, let's start from the bottom up, if you will. So we have these things called variable costs, the things we have to pay because we made the sale. So for a service-based provider, uh, it's primarily going to be our time. 
in, mm-hmm. in, the, in the execution of whatever we're doing. And then we're going to have to cover those costs, those fixed costs, the ones we've got to pay no matter what. Like you talked about, Kristen, the subscriptions, we got to pay our insurance. If we have a premises, we got to pay our rent, all those kinds of things. And so when we can add those all together, we can see how much we're making um, and, and see if there's room there for a profit. But we can't just set our pricing in isolation. We have to then scan the, the market and, and see does the ideal client that we want, are they willing to pay the price that we want? Um, what are our competitors charging? Are we actually competitors or are we targeting two different um, levels of client? So we might have more value in our offering. So we need to make sure we're articulating it and make sure we're char- charging the right amount and we're positioning it right. So if we do all of that up front, ideally, we might make some pivots at the beginning of our business. Maybe we're going to change the offer. Maybe we're going to change who we're targeting. Maybe we're changing the price. But we can learn all of that up front before we, we spend a lot of time and money. Um, but any time is good to do that, especially if you find that you're short on cash and you're not able to get that steady paycheck yourself. You want to validate and and often it's about making tweaks it's not about making wholesale changes so um perfect example anything where you're doing something um like an auto body garage it could be a kitchen where you're using a bunch of stuff not charging and factoring that into your pricing uh or into your costs that you need to cover like rags or oil or laundry all of those kinds of things all add up but we we often forget about them so when we try to do the math in our head, sometimes we forget stuff. And so I, I highly encourage that we write it down to make sure that we're, we're capturing everything. So I've explained it really simply, but we've got to build from the cost structure up and then look from the top down at the, the landscape. But the other thing that comes in, and, and you touched upon this when we, really, we just started the interview, was about our mindset and how we were brought up about money. Because if we've all of a sudden gone into business now for ourselves, um, all of our insecurities are going to come up and anything that um, affects our view and our views form about money when we're probably five to seven years of age. So whatever was going on in our household is still with us. And that's dictating how we react in certain situations. Um, you might have well-intentioned family and friends who are saying, who do you think you are being going out and charging that for what you're doing? That might be the voice you hear in your head. And so being able to articulate the value not only for yourself but comfortably for your clients and sticking with the prices you know you need to charge because often people will figure out once they get to the place where they figure out the right price but then there's a a hard time actually saying it and executing it that's a different thing so um, you can work on your mindset definitely requires changes in routine but you can certainly change the way you think about money Mm -hmm. yeah i think i was talking to somebody else about that the other day too like how the, the older I get and the more therapy I have, um, the more I realize there's so many of these like little, the, the childhood things. It's like I was doing um, uh, inner child work about, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like relationships and, and all those kinds of things. And I was like, man, this stuff happened to me. Like, I thought I knew what the things were, you know, because like I'm self-aware or reflective. I know uh, theoretically where the trauma comes from, but it's really, it starts so much earlier than that before you even really know what's happening. It's not like, this one instance when you were 12 um, created the way that you think about money. It's all the things that you just pick up, you know, how your parents talk about it, or they stress out about money all the time, are they fighting about paying the bills, working more, et cetera. Um, And then it's just like, it's there. And you have to like get to that to unravel all of it. I'm like, it's nuts. (laughs) Yeah. I I did a lot of volunteering, like with girl guides and the little ones, the sparks, the five to seven year olds. And one of the little girls, she told me uh, money's evil. Oh, yeah. Not imagine what happens in her house, because I bet she doesn't really know what money is, but yeah. she knows that it's evil. So there's probably crying or yelling or there's fighting or maybe the phone's ringing because there's all these collectors calling. Yeah. Um, like that's staying with her. So unless she consciously does something as she gets older to change that, um, every time she probably gets a bill, she probably got a pit in her stomach. Mm-hmm. She's probably uh, going to go out and spend to make herself feel better when she has negative emotions. Like all those kinds of things are going to stay with you. And unless you address them at their root, um, you can't really make that change and, and, yeah. and, and influence things, whether or not, you know, it's happening because it's always under the surface. Yeah. It's so annoying too. Cause I, I talk about this <laughs> with my best friend. I'm like, we're so self-aware that it's annoying, you know, like, I'm like, it would be better if we just didn't know. Right. But then we think sometimes that we have it all figured out because we know what the things are. And then it's like, no, but you really don't. It's just like, uh, 
coping mechanisms, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like you have to really get in there. So um, I highly advise that too, at some point, like if you can figure out what your money blocks are or in general, any of the other stuff too, but man, like you set yourself free in a lot of different ways. So um, yeah, it's huge. So as far as like the like pricing strategy goes, like what are some things to consider to like, I know um, a lot of people I talk to think like, I want to make this much per hour, but then they forget to calculate um, like the overhead expenses still of like running your business, basically, like you still have to pay taxes mm-hmm. and everything. So if you want to make 30 bucks an hour, 50 bucks an hour, whatever it is, um, that's cool. But you also still have to like compensate for some of those other things too. Is there like a formula? Absolutely. So it's going to be dependent by industry. So there's no one size fits all. Okay. Um, but if you know generally um, what your costs are to break even, so that's to get a profit of zero, you can, for every sale you make, you can um, notionally apply like the same percentage of overhead to make sure you're covering it on every sale. So if we have our total sales for the year minus our variable costs, those things we've got to pay because we sold something, um, whatever we've got left, then we can take off that percentage of overhead. So overhead in some businesses could be only 20% of sales. In others, it could be 75, depends on on really the business. And then down to the sales level, if you try to cover that same percentage of overhead in every sale, as long as you hit the total sales, you're going to be covered. And then you can can tack on as well that target profit. Um, That's what you're doing. If you're working in some kind of service business where you've got a finite amount of hours where you can do it, so maybe you're you're seeing coaching clients, maybe you're a chiropractor, um, you can also then um, figure out based on the number of hours you're going to work, um, how many people can you see and, and what's your target profit you want to make, and then you can figure out your hourly rate that way as well, um, keeping in mind that you're covering your overhead. So certainly... Um, Number one, pay attention to those numbers, um, because I, I can guarantee that most business owners are not really thinking twice. They're thinking more about the the competition, about what customers are saying, whereas um, maybe they need to find a, a cheaper supplier of a particular thing. Maybe, mm-hmm. they, maybe they need to articulate more the value in what they're selling so that people don't think it's expensive. They're just not really understanding with a full proposition. And so figuring out what the issue is and then being able to dig into it and making those minor tweaks will, will make um, a big difference in cash flow makes a big difference on the bottom line and, and definitely in stress levels because stress levels are going to go down when things are more comfortable. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And so then there's really not a huge difference as far as like service based versus product based. It's more about like the industry or like what the, the different things are that you have to consider. Like what's your version of overhead and break even point. Um, exactly. Okay. That makes sense. And so um, writing it all down though is super important because there's all these little things we're paying for these little plugins that make this thing attached to this. Mm-hmm. And we've got all these expenses going on that if we don't actually look at our, our, our statements, whether a credit card or a bank statement and, and di- document them all, we're going to miss some of those. And then all of a sudden we're not making the money we think we're making. Mm-hmm. Or you're just spending money on things that you don't need to spend money on. Like I have to go back and check my subscriptions yeah. regularly because I'm like, did I sign up for something that, cause sometimes I'll just do it like on a whim. I'm like, Oh, I need this thing. And then I find another solution. I forget to go back and do it. Um, so yeah, <laughs> to like constantly check and be like, what am I still using or what can I cancel? Um, Absolutely. (laughs) Especially for online businesses, like we're using so many of those things. And if you know, you're going to use something for the longer term, um, as long as uh, monthly cash or your cash flow allows for it, um, paying annually is cheaper. Mm -hmm. Um, But you have to know you want to use it for the whole year and your cash flow has to permit for you to pay it that one time a year. So yeah, that's I, a little bit of complexity. Yeah, I I usually tell people not to buy it up front until they've used it for at least six months because I've had multiple clients that have done that because it saves money, right? And especially if it's like a few hundred bucks or something where you can just afford to do that right now, um, great. But then you're paying for something for an extra six months that you never even use. So that's usually something that I do because I've done that myself too. I'm like, oh, yeah piece of cake. And then three months later, everything's evolved and I'm not even using the same stuff anymore. So I was like, oh, this is dumb. Um, But yeah, so I think uh, that's helpful too, Mm -hmm. for sure. And then once you're using it for a while, like you said, do the annual and then get a discount because it's usually at least like 10 to 20%. I think it depends. It's like a month or two for free sometimes. So it can be worth it for sure. Um, 
So as an entrepreneur and business owner yourself, what advice would you give fellow business owners about running their businesses? Um, ask for help. Mm -hmm. uh, seek, out, seek out people who know things that are different than you. Make sure you're building out a support system. So when I went from corporate and started my own business, um, I had lots of great friends, but most of them worked in corporate. So I needed to get into different networking groups, needed to build new connections so that I had people who were going along the journey with me. Um, I'm a huge fan of business coaches. So find a person who can help you with what you need help. You're going to get there faster um, with less stress and be able to, to bounce things off of them. And I'm a fan of going as fast as I, I can. We're all smart people. We can all figure things out, but do we need to on our own? <laughs> and do we, we don't have the time either. So recognizing um, where you don't know things and then getting the right person to help you, I think is important. And, and having a strategy, but being uh, flexible and, and agile enough to change it when you need to. So we can't be so rigid to a business plan that we don't um, make changes based on what we're seeing in our customer base, in our own environment. And we need to be react, um, make planned changes in reaction to what we're seeing um, so that we can keep the business going and continue to serve the clients in the way that we want to. Mm -hmm. That's great. Those are all great. Great tips. Yeah. I uh, I think a lot of people think that they're going to get a lot more support from their friends and family and then are sorely disappointed uh, mm -hmm. when that doesn't happen. Um, it's pretty common though. I think that people don't, it's just, it's one of those things. Like I work with a lot of realtors and they're like, why didn't, you know, my friend didn't want to use me to buy the house. And I was like, well, there's a few things. One, do you actually know what you're doing? They don't know. And if they work with you and you're terrible, then they're not going to be friends with you anymore. Like it's going to be, it's going to ruin the relationship. So it's just like one of those weird, like risk things that a lot of people don't really want to do, or they don't want somebody knowing all that personal stuff about mm -hmm. them. Too. They're involved through some of the, the, you know, financial planning process and um, finding a mortgage broker and they know information, you know? So it's like, there's a few different things, but I'm like, most cases you're not going to sell to your friends and family, unless you've been a realtor for like 10 years. <laughs> so um, it's okay. Like don't, like find, find other places and other, other sources for um, clients and customers for sure. And for the support too, because they don't know what it's like running yeah. a business. Um, yep. They're going to have their own views. They don't know how hard it is um, unless they've done it themselves. And then even that stuff, their money stories is going to, are going to come up. So if they see you doing well, Oh, look what you're doing. Why do you need to keep working so hard? How much money do you need? Like all kinds of stuff will mm -hmm. will come up. So sometimes you have to put some boundaries around um, relationships and it might be just as simple as um, I love you. I don't want to talk about my business with you. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about everything else. And I want to spend time with you, but I don't want to talk about that. And yeah. Sometimes we have to do that because we have to protect ourselves so we can keep going because you've got to be really resilient to have your own business. Yep. <laughs> yes. Uh, a friend of mine said, if you ever want to, find out about yourself, start a business, <laughs> like learn more and grow. <laughs> like that's a, it's like a self growth journey on steroids. And I was like, yeah, for real, <laughs> it's like, a whole different, it's a whole different game. Um, what resources do you wish you'd known about or taken advantage of when you started out? Um, probably would have hired sooner. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had the cash flow, and I, I did for too long. I did too much on my own and I could have grown faster and I could have built things out um, a lot faster if I, I employed more help. Um, mm -hmm. So hire as quickly as you can afford to. And it doesn't mean full-time people. If you can bring someone on for three hours a week, do it. Um, free up your time so you can do the stuff that you're better at. Because as I said, everybody's smart. Everyone can figure things out. But the question is, do you need to? And is that the best use of your time? Because there are so many things that you need to do. You've always got this huge to-do list. So um, get the support and, and do it as early as you can. That's perfect. Yep. Um, so tell us how we can support you. What are you working on? Can we help spread the word for you about anything? Uh, well, absolutely. So we always have ongoing enrollment into the Cash Control Bootcamp, which is our, our six-week group program for entrepreneurs. Um, so love to have anybody who's interested, who wants to learn more, reach out. LinkedIn's the best place um, for you to reach me. Tracy has an E and Visit has two S's and two T's. And because uh, I hope people are inspired from listening, uh, we're going to get 
focused on their finances, I do have a gift for your audience, Kristen, uh, which is a money meeting agenda. So if you haven't had any dedicated time to look at your finances, you can certainly um, take a look at this. You can grab it at cashcoach.biz. And so your first meeting might be just looking at the agenda, and then you're going to set another meeting to actually work through the agenda. But it gets you started if the financial side is something you kind of put to the side. Uh, So cashcoach.biz to get that money meeting agenda. Perfect. Um, Well, anything else before we wrap up? Um, So I'd like to talk about financial fitness. As I mentioned earlier, Mm -hmm. when we talk about um, financial literacy and we talk about just the financial stuff, people are usually on their heels. They're feeling embarrassed. They're feeling ashamed. Financial fitness, to me, it's a lifelong journey. We're all improving from wherever we are. Um, So take those forward steps every day. Um, They're going to be imperfect. You're going to try your best. But if we keep moving ahead, we're going to advance our knowledge and build that foundation. And um, please be kind with yourself when you're on the journey because you're going to make mistakes. It's going to be frustrating. Um, You you just need to regroup and keep moving ahead with those small imperfect actions. And I know that when you do that, it really changes the trajectory of where your business goes and then ultimately where your life goes um, because you've got that handle and that control over the money uh, in all of those places. So uh, have patience and kindness with yourself. That's great. Yep. I love it. Um, Perfect. Well, thank you for hanging out with me. I greatly appreciate it. And um, I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. But yeah, thanks for joining. Thanks so much, Kristen.